Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Making the Culture Shift, Faculty Engagement and Learning Outcomes Assessment. This webinar is all about tips and tricks to engage faculty in learning outcomes assessment projects. My name is Alexander McFarland, and I am a researcher at the Higher Education Quality Council of Ontario, otherwise known as HECO, and I will be the moderator for today's event. As I go over some housekeeping items and introduce today's panelists, please take a moment to fill out the poll on the right-hand side of your screen. This will help our presenters better understand who you are. So a few things before we begin. If you have questions for the panelists or are experiencing any technical problems, please feel free to ask your questions on the Q&A section on the bottom right-hand side of the screen. When you do this, please keep the send defaulted to all panelists so all three of our presenters today and myself can see your questions. You may be wondering how many other participants are attending this webinar, and it may seem like you're the only one, but this is not the case. Unfortunately, you cannot see who's in attendance, and you also will not be able to see the questions that are being asked. So after all three panelists have had a chance to present, there will be approximately 15 minutes for questions at the end of this webinar, and I will read your questions so everyone can hear them. We would like to answer everyone's questions, but considering the large size of our group today, we would like to apologize in advance if we do not get to your question. For those of you who cannot stay with us for the full hour or for your colleagues that were not able to join us, you will be able to find this webinar posted on our website at www.heco.ca shortly following today's session. So without further delay, it is my pleasure to welcome today's presenters. With us, we have Ms. Veronica Brown, an instructional developer for the curriculum and programming at the University of Waterloo Center for Teaching Excellence. We also have Dr. Jill Atkinson, an associate professor and chair of undergraduate studies in the Department of Psychology at Queen's University. And last, but definitely not least, we have Dr. Peggy Mackey, a consultant who works with colleges and universities to assist them build a sustainable commitment to assessing students' progress towards attaining higher quality degrees. So if you have not already done so, please answer the three poll questions on the right-hand side of the screen. The poll will be closing in approximately 10 to 15 seconds. So at this point in time, I'd like to pass it over to Ms. Veronica Brown. Thanks, Alex. So hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us this morning. I am going to start the session by talking about something that I think is a precursor or something that's happened concurrently as you develop a culture of assessment, and that's about looking at your own community within your department. So for today, what I want to do is talk about how we bring, how assessment culture can actually be brought to the surface. And the analogy I want to use today is the cultural iceberg. This is an idea that came from Edward Hall, and the idea is that we have a surface culture which represents the observable behaviors and practices that we see within our own department, but the deep culture represents things like our attitudes, our beliefs, even the rules within our communication style. And so as an example, what we see across the departments at Waterloo would be how often we meet as a department, who, is a, who comes to those, how we interact at those department sessions. We have quite a few programs, for example, that our multiple departments come together to run the program, and so how they interact is sort of a fusion of all of those different dep departments' cultures. So today I want to think about three different areas. One is the importance of articulating a shared vision. That I think is before we even can worry about assessment or what we're trying to help our students achieve, we need to think about the ideas that we as a group have. The second one is who owns the process and who leads this process of assessment. And then finally, talking about the conversations that we're having about curriculum and assessment. Are we having the conversations maybe just within a group of courses that we're all teaching in a consistent way? Are we having those conversations across our whole department? 
the, the idea of a shared vision is something that Peter Wolf talks a lot about in his work in curriculum work. Um, at the end of my session, there are a couple of resources, and I would highlight the one from 2007 that has a whole visioning process articulated in it. The visioning part that we use is what do we want from our students? And so one of the first things that we do with a department is to talk about who is the ideal graduate of our department, what are the knowledge, the skills, and the values that they develop, how are they developing these attributes? And so we think about what are the shared experiences, something that a lot of departments at Waterloo have is a co-op program. Some are mandatory co-op where all students participate in the cooperative process whereas some departments have both a regular stream and a co-op stream. And so we talk about where, if these are the outcomes for the program, what might be the, the distinctions between those two streams of students, and then how are we and our students assessing their own progress. Having created that vision, we need to think about the influence. And this is an area that I want to highlight today because Diamond, in his 2008 book, has a, a great point about the fact that without support from the chair, without support from the administrators of the department, it's really challenging to do this work. People need the resources to be able to try new things and to look at their assessment critically, and they also need the freedom to try something new or different. And so in a program where traditionally, I certainly in my undergrad, we had lots of of midterms, 30%, final 60%, 10% assignments, that's pretty much everything I did in first year. Well, what happens if that's the culture within the department and then someone wants to come and try something new or try an open book exam or have no exam at all? And so they need permission um, to be able to, to go out and try those new things. The other part is about ownership. And so this, I think, is absolutely critical, that whatever you do, it needs to be a faculty-driven process. If it just comes from the chair or it just comes from the institution, then it, it becomes something where it's just a bunch of check boxes that we have to complete rather than something that truly can be integrated within into that culture of assessment. And vice versa, if there's you know, one or two faculty who are just trying something new, how do they get that to become influential across the whole system? The other part that's really critical about influence is about the idea of sustainability of the process. When we have leaders in a position, we know that within the academic environment, that leadership changes on a fairly regular basis, whether it's a three-year term, a five-year term. Assessment is a long-term commitment. It is something that doesn't just happen all at once. We don't, you know, we have, we have the opportunity to do formal program review every seven or eight years, but if the only time that we look at that assessment process is once every eight years, then we don't get the benefit from it. We aren't looking critically at our own processes. We aren't looking at how we're assessing our students, and it never will become embedded into our curriculum if we only look at it once every eight years. But during that eight-year process, there could be two or three changes in the undergraduate chair, and so how does that impact the process? And that's where influence can also be gained through a sense of community by looking at who is our outcomes committee or who is our curriculum committee. Some departments at Waterloo now have both. They have one that's focused on the overall program assessment. One focuses on the smaller or not smaller, but the more finite or granular level of the curriculum. And so building community between those groups and with the department is really important because I think that's what helps to make this a sustainable and ongoing project. The third component I want to talk about is about the language. One of the reasons at Waterloo we, we have within our uh, process, we adopted the six oodles undergrad degree level expectations, and then at Waterloo for undergrads, we added two more, one about experiential education and another about diversity, which we think better represents us as an institution. And while it's important to integrate the oodles into our program review process, 
what we have found to be most successful is that when people are able to reframe that either by articulating changes to the oodles or actually developing their own program level outcomes. And those outcomes need to reflect their own language and their own frameworks. By fully integrating the culture of your discipline into this process, I think it better reflects what you're trying to develop in your students. So critical thinking, problem solving, communication, we all have, I, I think every department I've worked with, and I've worked with over 40 at Waterloo, has some sort of outcome related to communication. But their definition and the language they use in defining that outcome is very different. It, it includes what are the media that are important? What, who is the audience? Are we looking to, how do we communicate with our peers? How do we communicate with people outside the discipline? And so being able to articulate that shared language and having the debates and arguments and um, thinking about well, what do we really mean by problem solving in our department or program? What does critical thinking, how do we actually define that in a measurable way? I think those conversations help to bring that deep culture up to the surface. Having a concise definition is valuable. And again, I think it's those curriculum conversations that help to start to develop that community. So ultimately, our goal in all of this work is to create what we call an aligned assessment strategy, where the assessment is of the assessment of our program, but then it can align with what we're doing in our everyday class, in our lessons, and how we're developing our courses so that there's alignment between those different levels of assessment. Again, I think it's critical that it's a shared process from all department members. That includes faculty, staff, and students. Alumni members have, are another key group of stakeholders who can contribute to defining these expectations. And most importantly, it needs to be an ongoing assessment conversation because having to revisit those definitions, the reality is the department makeup eight years from now won't be the same. We do have changes in our faculty. Uh, we have retirements. We have new faculty joining us. And if we only have those conversations every eight years, what happens if you join the department during that time? And so I think this ongoing conversation is really important. I'll leave these, re these references up just for a moment, but I do want to remind you again that they're available on the HECO site once the slides have been posted. If this is something that you're coming to in a new way, I strongly encourage you to start with the special edition of New Directions for Teaching and Learning. When I started this work several years ago, that was rec recommended to me, and I've, I keep going back to that resource over and over again. At this point, I would like to turn it over to Jill, and I'll let Tahani move that over to Jill. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Veronica. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to take a few minutes now to talk to you from a faculty member perspective, one that is grounded in my particular experience here at Queen's. So perhaps I should start with a disclaimer that the following represents my observations and opinions. Um, let me just pull up my next slide here. Traditionally, most faculty members are hired as specialists, often in a field far removed from cognitive psychology. And you might think, well, why does that matter? Well, it matters because in a balanced academy, we're hired not only to further knowledge in our own area, but we're also equally responsible for designing the student learning experience, and that includes assessment. This is stating the obvious and the well-known problem of expecting those who have no expertise in how humans learn, no expertise in attention, memory, or cognition, for example, let alone experience and knowledge about self-regulation and motivation, and of expecting these folks to know how to promote learning among a group of 19-year-old novice students. That is a rather large problem. So what's the solution? Well. We need to train them up, right? We need to get faculty involved in teaching and learning work. So the trick is, how do we move faculty from what might be represented by the left side of this graphic, from more or less communicating the content of a textbook to their students, to, 
more toward the right end of this graphic, where there's someone with expertise in designing courses for learning. Without participation from the instructors themselves, the ones doing the teaching, universities aren't going to make much headway in meeting their teaching mission and becoming truly balanced academies, where we put as much attention uh, toward the teaching and learning mission as we do toward the research mission. However, underlying this process of wanting to train faculty, train instructors, for example, in assessment and course design, is an assumption that not all faculty members share. It's one that says that if we're to move forward as educators, we need to know whether we're meeting the goals that we've set for our students. And that, that means that we need to articulate and we need to measure outcomes. And as I said earlier, that's not necessarily something that all faculty agree with. It can be difficult at times to get this buy-in. Now, if you've ever been in a meeting where your colleagues are first learning about the importance of well-aligned courses and learning about how to develop learning outcomes and mapping their assessments onto those outcomes, you might know what I mean about buy-in. In my experience, sometimes it can get quite heated. Everyone can have an opinion about how best to teach. Um, not all of our colleagues will see the need for such a backward approach to designing courses. And it's, you know, it's not uncommon, in my experience, to hear faculty um, say that it's students' responsibility to pay attention and do their readings before coming to class, or you know, the approach that you're telling us about might work in the sciences, but it would never work in the, for example, humanities. In my experience, there can be a lot of resistance on ideological grounds. So the trick is to figure out what the barriers are and how we might be able to, to lower them to some degree. So it seems to me there's two major barriers. The first, as I um, alluded to, are the more ideological barriers. People who don't necessarily agree that we need to articulate learning outcomes and measure them. They might believe, for example, and, and this is fairly common, I think, that it's more important to tackle issues like class size, working conditions, and academic freedom, that these deserve more attention if we want to improve the undergrad education. And certainly, I'm not arguing that those aren't also important. This could be salient to me right now at Queen's because we've just been through a round of bargaining and, and heard some of these arguments. However, as you can see from my slide, I'm going to recommend that you don't tackle ideological uh, issues head on. I think that ideology runs rather deep, far beyond the reach sometimes of, of science. So rather than tackle it, um, I prefer to work with instructors who are looking to improve their course in some small way or who are interested in learning about ways to improve their teaching more generally. In other words, faculty who are, all, who are already identified or have already identified themselves as being open to um, changing what they're doing, who don't necessarily believe that the status quo is working for them and their students. So as a result, I want to focus on the second set of obstacles and how we can overcome them to engage faculty assessment. And when I say over, how we can overcome them, I mean just how I, as a faculty member in a department who is not someone with, um, with official training in instructional design or, or educational development. So I call the second set of barriers um, the more practical and social ones. These are things like time, um, professional support, social support. Because when I ask my colleagues, and I've done this this last week, what prevents them from reflecting on and revising their assessment practices, it's invariably time. Time in the sense that this activity isn't deemed as important or valuable as research activity. And I put research in invisible air quotes um, because I want to talk later about how doing some of this scholarship of teaching and learning obviously is another type of research. So, Amongst some of my colleagues, despite enjoying and really being dedicated to their teaching, the incentives at a research-intensive university are still not there for teaching. As a result, it's not unusual to find instructors who are sessionals, so in our case that would be kind of adjuncts or graduate students, who are most engaged in the centers for teaching and learning. They're the ones who are focused on teaching for one thing, and then they also see a connection between putting time and effort into this work in order to move forward in their careers. The same incentives aren't there for tenure-track faculty who don't have to compete for teaching jobs every year. We're, they're just assigned, right? Now, we've made headway at Queen's, and I know that other institutions have as well, by increasing the recognition of and rewarding the faculty who make time to work on teaching improvements, whether it's redesigning their own course or participating in wider initiatives like task forces, et cetera, and academic planning committees. And that can include merit evaluations where we really do um, monetize um, people's involvement with teaching and learning. 
as well as public recognition like teaching awards, which I think are quite common. And that's certainly part of the answer. But I think another part of the answer is to make the activity enjoyable and respected. In addition to career awards, merit points, I think another way to get tenure track faculty to shift some of their time and focus away from their area of research and towards educational research is to offer a supportive community in which to work. One that, that does include knowledgeable peers, so people who are maybe a little further ahead on the teaching and learning um, you know, development continuum, as well as plain old social support. So that brings me to, to kind of what has worked for me. If I can just um, indulge for about five minutes and tell you a little bit about my experience and what really got me involved in the doing the work of assessment, which can be um, quite difficult and um, never ends, as I think Peggy will talk to us about. Now, this may be a personal preference, but for me, having a colleague with whom to work closely and share the burden, because as I've said, it is rather uh, difficult work, to share the burden of evaluating our teaching and then redesigning a course or courses to improve learning makes all the difference in the world. Um, I've worked on a, a few projects in the last few years, and one of them was when I led a large intro psych course redesign. So we have a large intro psych course here, as most universities do. And over the course of about three years, we redesigned this, the course rather radically. I worked very closely with another uh, prof in the psych department. And if it weren't for her, and now a dedicated staff member with whom I work closely to sustain and modify the course, I wouldn't have been able to complete this work. It was having someone to brainstorm and share decision making with, to have you know, two heads instead of one that really allowed me to see that project through to the end. Another example of a project that I worked on that was kind of fun was um, developing a, an introductory stats course for five different departments at Queen, social science departments that had had trouble staffing their intro stats course. Um, and together with two colleagues in math and stats, we had a data librarian and an instructional developer. And we met every week over the summer last summer. And we really had a lot of fun. We learned lots from one another. And we ended up generating some really great small group activities for our students in the process of redesigning uh, or of designing a course, a flipped classroom approach to teaching stats to um, students from different disciplines. And the sort of shared responsibility in that project, having five of us, really reduced the burden. And it kept us accountable to one another. And so it was a way of ensuring that we got the job done over the course of the summer. And I'll just uh, follow up with one last example, which is, which is the HECO project. Um, in my case, I'm an instructor of Psych 100. And Queen's is part of this HECO Learning Outcomes Consortium. And as a result, Queen's hired some researchers. And they came to me as an instructor of a first year course and said, do you mind if we assess some of the learning outcomes uh, of your students. So written communication, problem solving, critical thinking, for example. And they came, and I had very little, required very little of my time and effort, and they came and assessed my students' competencies. And I learned so much from this process and the feedback that they provided me. And it then, of course, opened my eyes to how I might do a better job training students to master some of those competencies. So this is another case of having been able to work with and learn from other people to advance sort of teaching and learning enterprise. In addition to having um, a support of, like personal support and a colleague to work with, I think it's important to be part of a larger sort of teaching and learning community at your university. Now, I think most logically this is done through centers of teaching and learning. Um, interestingly, um, I'm involved in, in, a, in a group that's a little more ad hoc, that's not through a uh, center for teaching and learning. I think the reason why this is so important is that in my experience, you um, might not have the most support in your home department, and you might find more of your support outside your department uh, from um, similar thinking peers. It seems to me that, that often faculty who focus on teaching are marginalized. And so, as I said, they're not necessarily supported in the department. And the second part of that is that the work they do then isn't necessarily doesn't really have an impact on the, their own department's practices. And to address that, and I think this echoes some of the things that Veronica has said, I think it's really important to have a mandate from the leadership at your university, from wh whatever level that is, she's mentioned the chair and even higher up at the faculty level, that makes um, engaging in learning outcomes assessment a priority. Because if it becomes a, a requirement or a priority, 
those folk who are willing and knowledgeable in the department, perhaps those folks who have been somewhat marginalized, they'll be the ones that people will turn to as uh, for help. They'll be seen as valuable assets, they'll be more supported, and be able to take the lead in establishing practices like identifying degree level outcomes and or degree level expectations and mapping that onto the curriculum. Now to finish this off, I want to address a, a question that I was asked recently. And it was what, what would be my advice to someone who's trying to get a fellow faculty member excited about learning outcomes assessment? And um, I certainly think it's important to do things department wide and to have um, institutional commitment. But in my experience, sort of working at the grassroots, one faculty member at a time, has been what I've found to be um, the most effective. And so to be really concrete about it for a few seconds, I, would, I find that if I casually offer to work on a course with someone, maybe start with a small piece like an assignment that isn't working that they want to revise, and just have a conversation where I ask my colleague what they're hoping to accomplish with the assignment and how have students responded to it in the past, and be available to brainstorm, maybe help identify what's the learning objective for the assignment, how does it fit into the course, what would mastery look like. I find that most, most people who teach have implicit learning outcomes in mind and goals for their students. They just need help making them explicit and then going beyond that and making them measurable. At that point, sometimes it's a good idea to introduce rubrics, maybe help your colleague tweak the activity or develop an, an altogether new one, and then sit down and look at how their students perform with them. Sometimes this highlights for them what students aren't mastering and leads to better instruction on their part. In addition to that kind of just one-on-one -on -one spending time with someone, which is sort of the social support part, it's great if you can invite a colleague to attend a workshop with you or maybe even a conference. If they're, they're usually at this point well positioned or open to learn and they're motivated to seek out information that's going to help them in their own teaching. So in a sense they have a need and you're providing them with the, the tools to address it. Um, there are workshops obviously in Centers for Teaching and Learning at our own universities, in Ontario at the um, Council of Ontario Universities, and there's a great workshop or a symposium I'd recommend at McMaster in the summers. These are all things that are local and not very expensive. And then finally, in a piece that I, I know I fall short on, is really promoting the scholarship of teaching and learning. To me, this is where our work often stops. Once we've demonstrated that our students have improved learning, maybe we can show that they're, they've increased their engagement scores and they're better motivated, that's great, we're done, we've, you know, we've figured out how we can improve our course. But if you can organize a few brainstorming sessions to help colleagues prepare a presentation for a department or a Center for Teaching and Learning workshop, or perhaps maybe work with them on writing up a paper for their discipline's teaching journal, that's even better. Being able to go further and, and promote the scholarship of teaching and learning, to my mind, is, is the icing on the cake and something that I think a, a lot of us kind of run out of steam before we get to. So that's sort of my perspective, being kind of on the, the front lines as a faculty member. And I think now I'll turn it over to Peggy. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm happy to have joined my colleagues Veronica and uh, Jill today and much of what you'll hear me say uh, echoes uh, many of the points that they've already uh, brought up. I would like to focus on the title of this slide because it takes off the table an issue that both of my colleagues have identified, which is to see this as an externally driven, possibly internally driven uh, mandate that positions people to, to look at this as something they have to do. And I'm going to sort of take that away for now to say that I really think that we need to look at what the internal motivators and drivers of this can be by building a culture of inquiry. I really believe that this is uh, driven by intellectual curiosity, the same intellectual curiosity that faculty use in, in their research, but now it's focused on specifically how students learn and what are the barriers that they typically face as they learn from point of entry, as they make progress um, towards degree. So I am going to focus on the issue of assessment uh, to capture the enduring learning that we're looking for at the end, but by looking at what that progression looks like um, as students um, uh, take their courses, engage in their experiential learning along the way. My fear is that if we look at only one point in time or only at the end, 
it may be too late to actually address the kinds of questions or issues uh, that students face as they learn that may often cause them to say, well, I'm just not going to do this anymore, uh, I'm going to drop out, uh, or in fact they may fail. So let me identify some of the levers that I think you might be able to use to bring more people into this commitment, either at your program level or the institutional level. And to say that any one of these may be a possibility for you, uh, eventually I think these all come together in a sustainable um, commitment. But I'm going to spend a slide on each of these. And my colleagues have already mentioned the importance of bringing people together to agree on the expectations for student learning. Those are your student learning outcomes, the institutional level ones, as well as the ones in their particular major program of study. And it is a place to begin to bring colleagues together to say, what are we really expecting our students to demonstrate at the point of graduation? Uh, and that really becomes the anchor of this effort, because if that isn't there, then it's every ship on its own, so to speak. And what we're really trying to say is we do agree there are essential outcomes in the major. Some of them are uh, specified through professional bodies. In other instances, we may have to do that ourselves, but it's got to be there to be able to then uh, move forward and look at course design, curricular design, and the kinds of assessments that will provide us chronological evidence evidence of the learning. I think another way to bring people in, actually, is to identify the patterns of student underperformance that faculty talk about, and I'll go into this a little bit more detail, and ways that if they're not apparent, we can learn about them as soon as possible. The third component I'd like to talk about has to do with the degree to which we are engaging students in their learning over time. I think that's the element that is significant here that the driver really is a focus on student success and the barriers that may be holding them up from that particular um, positive engagement. And finally, I'd like to talk about how important I think it is for colleagues to be able to see, if not see, at least come together to look at how well students are making progress. What we don't see, I think we tend not to pay attention to. Um, and then the advances in technology now and in the development of dashboards, I'll show you one in the end, it is quite possible for all of us to become knowledgeable about how well students are making progress uh, towards a high quality degree. And that places emphasis more on what I call real-time assessment, using the uh, results uh, immediately. So the sets of questions that could be raised to bring faculty members together and others in the co-curriculum as well, because student learning is occurring in multiple contexts. Students are coming from different backgrounds. Some of them already um, have been in at an institution, may have dropped out or returning is to focus on what we expect all of them to demonstrate at point of graduation. That's, that's your anchor, which may also include institution level outcomes, such as the importance of communication outcomes, such as writing and speaking. And what's happening now is we are looking at how well programs are actually integrating those institution level outcomes across students learning in their major programs of studies that we no longer can silo learning opportunities to say, well, this is a course where you're supposed to get this, and they're supposed to hold on to that for three or four years. We're looking now at how students have multiple and diverse and chronological opportunities to develop those particular outcomes um, within the context of their major program of study as well. Next kind of question to ask is, how will we know the kind of progress that our students are making. So what would be our criteria and standards of judgment uh, that will enable us to look at work as students progress to see if that progression is really taking place? Um, so if we know, and I'll show you an example in a few moments, that entry level students have difficulty with certain conceptual understanding, and we know that from the moment they come in, how are we then designing courses to enable them to overcome those barriers, those misunderstandings that, if not caught early enough, could mean they drop out or they even fail as a result of that. 
So just as there's an agreement about the outcomes, there needs to be an agreement about what criteria and standards of judgment. Uh, Jill alluded uh, towards the end of her, her section on the importance of rubrics. That's, that's certainly one major means of, of agreement, which say when we look at students' writing, for example, what are the central attributes that we're looking at within, our, within their major? What are additional ones that we want to see? But you have a, a shared language, a shared way of looking at work to mark that student progress along the way and identify, gee, they aren't really making the progress we thought they would uh, uh, based on how things look at this particular point. And then the issue becomes how do we, once we have agreed on the outcomes and the criteria, how do we actually foster all of those through the kind of aligned uh, curricular design that Jill described in that one slide where she looked at the older way of doing it versus the new one where we're thinking about if we want students to achieve a certain set of outcomes, how do we design for that learning uh, chronologically? And what are the sets of uh, assignments we use, what is the relationship between what we're doing and other co-curricular possibilities as well, um, so that we can see that there's a trajectory that we've worked up together that meaningfully takes students to the direction we'd like them to go. In the next slide, let's see, that one's not going there. Okay. <laughs> oh, um, I find an avenue for engaging people, particularly resistors, is to say, what are the patterns of students' performance and underperformance that we know typically students face, and how early do we know about them? And those kinds of conversations actually can occur in very informal uh, settings, such as water, what I call water cooler conversations, in which people um, maybe are talking to each other, and one says to the other, have you seen this in student work, or I'm kind of shocked that my students aren't able to do such and such, I would have expected by now they could. Um, so that's one way to sort of capture those. Um, it's, a, it's a way to bring people in. Um, the other thing to look at is to have bring people together at the end of the semester to talk about their responses to the student work and what they think they see as positive, what they still think are enduring kinds of issues that they face. I think one of the most effective ways of bringing people into this is to have them collaboratively score samples of student work. Um, and you would take off faculty members' names and you would take off the student's name, um, but you would make sure that you have a very good sampling from really great to not so great that people would actually score against your criteria and standards uh, of judgment. And what that often shows is that students may not travel with the learning as well as we think they should. So they may have done well in a course that focused on writing and two semesters later are asked to write and we look at those samples and say, gee, it just doesn't seem that they're carrying that through. And that's actually very important for people to see, uh, that what we think people carry with them may not be what they actually do carry with them. So this is a way to bring people in to say, here's the reality of what we see. Um, and another related strategy is to actually take your almost graduating students' exit level work, again, removing names, and say, all right, let's look at their uh, conceptual understanding or their ability to analyze or their communication or their critical thinking, whatever those, but in these papers, is it where we expect it to be? What's off? And I think that a collaborative effort does a lot to bring people together to open up the discussions. And it also, I think, opens up the issue that students don't carry everything we think we've taught them with them. <laughs> And in fact, the research will show that students forget 30% of what they learn as soon as they log off or uh, leave a classroom. So you can imagine the deterioration after that uh, that relates um, to the fact that they haven't done as well as we thought. So I'm going to show you an example, actually, of how assessment operates. And, and it's one in which people were collaboratively uh, involved and led to a dramatic change in pedagogy as a result of this assessment. 
assessment effort. And it comes from work in physics. It's called the FET Project, and I have on the following slide a reference for you, and I hope that you can actually go and look at it afterwards because it's fascinating to hear students talk about how they've learned under this new uh, method. Uh, but the issue that was addressed, so this is the issue of trying to lock into what are common patterns that students face is that in a method called concept inventories, which is an assessment of first-year physics students' understanding of concepts, it's historically been the case that students will carry and hold on to incorrect conceptual understanding of weight and force, all those issues, and even mathematical concepts. And the way that's documented is that students are given minor case studies and asked to describe or identify the concept that explains that particular um, outcome of that scenario. And it turns out that students will use the same concept to describe all the scenarios um, or they, they have completely misunderstood and, and call upon an incorrect one to answer. It has been historically proven that that's the case. And so the physicists, this is at the University of Colorado, sort of shaking their heads saying, well, maybe if we just teach harder uh, and do more labs, that will enable them to develop the correct conceptual uh, understanding. And so that's what they try, more labs, uh, more focus on the concepts, um, and find even with that, as they administer more of those concept inventories, students would still fall back to their original um, misunderstanding of, con of concepts. Do some reading research on learning that talks about the importance of students being engaged in their learning. And the leader of the project says, oh my goodness, when I do, a, when I talk about physics to people who don't understand it, um, I do these interactive simulations, which you'll see afterwards when you are able to click on that, on that wonderful website. It's the first thing people talk about, he said, when they leave. Why haven't we thought about that ourselves? Um, bring students into this project because they're central to figuring out how students misunderstand the concepts and develop what you'll see on the next page, but you'll be able to actually do these online. They're fascinating to work through. Each in the student then has before him or her on his or her computer a, a problem uh, with all the uh, items, gadgets, I guess you'd say, electricity that one needs to solve that problem. And what students do is solve it, but immediately get feedback that shows they're off because of their misunderstanding and are motivated to continue to work through it until they get the correct response. Um, these are now so popular that uh, they're, they've been developed not just in physics but across sciences, earth sciences, mathematics as well for levels I think even K through 16. And I think what's dramatic about the change is that it puts students at the center of the learning and they're doing the science and getting it. And that's what you'll hear testimony about when you look at that particular website, is even students who are not majors in physics will say, when I do this, because everything's moving, oh, I now understand how these things really work. Um, so what the expert always has in his or her mind is not what the student is developing, but by placing students in this engaged setting, actually there's documentation that they're uh, incorrect concepts are being restructured. The reason that this is so important is that if students don't develop that correct conceptual understanding early on, the further they go in the major, the less successful they are or they drop out. And that was sort of the central driving uh, concern of this particular effort. What I appreciate about the work is the engagement of students in it as they develop these scenarios so that they knew that these would work and make sense for them. The other piece that I think is worth talking about is how you engage students in their learning, much in the way I just t talked about, but through a chronological commitment to the learning. So we are certainly seeing, as, as I'm sure you are, the emergence of electronic portfolios that contain 
agreed upon signature assignments that we want to look at across students' learning to see how well they're making progress. But we're also now seeing the emergence of saying to students, what's work that you would like to include in these that demonstrates the outcomes uh, that we expect you and yourself uh, to be able to demonstrate. And we've included self-reflections on that, but not just to say, I think I'm pretty good at this, but to say, where it is, what is it that I need to improve uh, so that all of this accountability is built into the students. And in many cases, this is now changing the relationship between students and advisors about their learning. So advising isn't solely restricted to what you're going to take next semester, but uh, what, what particular courses would be of value to you to advance some of the areas where you need to improve. We're also seeing the importance of the development of now student dashboards in which students can actually see themselves. Uh, how well they're performing based on now what are called learning analytics that are becoming fairly widespread. Uh, and, and two other pieces that I think are very helpful for faculty to learn about how students view their learning in courses or over longer periods of time is a wonderful online free survey called SALG, Student Assessment of Their Learning Gains, in which students uh, describe for an individual course how well they believe they've learned the outcome based on the pedagogy or instruction of that used for that particular outcome. And what the program generates is a comparative chart that shows you your highs and lows. Um, so that was important for me to see because I thought I was perfectly clear about a principle I was talking about. And when I saw the results, the results said, no, they don't really understand what you're saying. So I needed that to be able to improve myself uh, and to understand that that's why they weren't doing that well in that particular area. And another possibility uh, is to use small group instruction diagnosis. And I think that's uh, uh, what you heard a little bit of Jill talking about when she said working with others. That's bringing in a trusted other to interview students either along a program of study or in a course to ask them outright, you know, what do you feel you're still struggling with? That comes back then to me. I don't know, need to know the student's name, um, but it becomes a way for me to respond on time uh, to my students' uh, learning. And the final piece that I want to talk about is the importance of people being able to see together how well students are progressing toward your exit level expectations. And so this is just one example of from an assessment management system in which uh, the results of scoring student work uh, are reported, and then that's accessible to all of us either in a department or I would say in the best case maybe even institutionally if we're tracking over time how well students are making progress um, towards the degree level outcomes we, uh, we expect. Um, these are, this is a, an institutional one. You know, now we're also seeing that students have them uh, as well. And it's leading us, I think, into what I call real time assessment and responding on time uh, because our students are becoming increasingly diverse, uh, representing very varied ways of um, having have been prepared to come into higher education, and so we need to be much more closely monitoring how our students are actually doing. So I'm hoping that some of this may, may help you, but we're all going to look forward to any questions that you may raise. And I'll send it back to Alexandra. So thank you so much, Veronica, Jill, and Peggy, for sharing your experiences engaging faculty in learning outcomes assessment. We are now going to take some questions from the audience. So to start us off, how important do you think creating a positive assessment culture will be in the next 5, 10, um, and into you know, 15 years? So we're going to start with maybe Veronica, then go to Jill, then go to Peggy. Thanks, Alex. I, so I, I have a couple of answers to that, but I think the short one that I'll give is that I, I think it's important right now. Um, I could speculate. We know that as every government changes, someone else has a different idea of what should be happening. Certainly that's what's been going on in Ontario. But 
I hope that it's not so much about these external pressures that are motivating it, but that as we continue to see the value of this outcomes assessment and, and its relationship in terms of how we're thinking about things for our own department and for our students, I hope it continues to grow. But again, I don't want that to be because of some external pressure, but, in, but more a recognition of why this is important to our students. Thanks, Alex. All right, Jill. Well, I think that that the importance is is going to only grow, um, and certainly something that I continue to to be aware of is kind of the tension between feeling as though, excuse me, that the instructors and the departments can be the ones sort of driving what to assess and how to assess, and not feeling as though it, it's all coming from as. as Veronica sort of suggested, you know, the, the government of the day, um, because I think there's a lot of pushback about that, that, you know, if you're assessing something every five years because you have to, people aren't often very engaged in the process, and obviously it's not, it's not a, a continuous process, which is ideal. So I think it's, the culture is very important, and that we really need to, as more faculty feel ownership and become part of that process, they'll be able to start to drive, you know, what should we be assessing and how we should be doing that across the years. Peggy, do you have any comments? Um, I'll just add to that in terms of uh, the student demographics, I think that we are likely to see that actually will become the drivers. I mean, um, I'm talking about this from a U.S. perspective, but I know that Canada is very much like us in terms of having um, so many different cultures coming in and becoming citizens, and that's, if you look at the projections to 2050, it's amazing um, how diverse our cultures will become. And related to that, then, are people having very different levels of preparation. So you have a lot of non-native speakers, for example, um, there's a, an undercut of our society where low-income students have really had limited access to higher education, yet that's a burgeoning population for us, and we've just got to bring them along to represent the country. Um, so I think that uh, what we're, it's going to be harder for us, in a sense, to say, oh, we can teach everybody and everybody's going to learn. We have to really... Uh, buckle up and say, wait a minute, we're going to have very diverse learners increasingly year after year. We're already seeing it, but the projections are even more incredible to look at. And so you can't make any assumptions of that all these students are going to get it, that we're going to have to look at assessment results to help us understand what kind of progress they're making and where they're stuck. All right, thank you. So our next question, what piece of advice would you give an administrator who wants to get faculty involved in learning outcomes assessment? So maybe this time we'll start with Jill, then go to Peggy, and then Veronica. Mm -hmm. A question in my mind, so I wish I had a really good answer for you. A piece of advice for for administrators. Well, I, you know, I, I hearken back to a visit I had at Guelph a couple of years ago when their provost uh, Serge Demera said basically that the role that an administrator needs to play. I think is to be very visible among faculty members um, and and let them know that they themselves view the importance of this work, and that you know it often means traveling from department to department, you know different visiting different groups of, of faculty members and staff to talk about it and and essentially being very patient because it takes a fair bit of time for that for that culture shift to happen. So I, I don't really have any advice except that, that I think administrators need to take a leadership role, be very visible, and be talking about how much they value a culture of assessment. And then obviously actually make some concrete changes to incentivize it. Mm. So Peggy? You said administrators, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah, okay. Um, I think a really interesting question for an administrator to ask is just to get people thinking about this if there is resistance or reluctance to do it is how curious are they about how well students travel with their learning beyond the course that they've taught towards the final level outcomes, let's say, of the program or of the institution. And that, I think, 
he just sort of opens up, let's look at what we already are accomplishing and what those patterns of strength are and what may be some of the patterns that we're not so happy about that could draw people in because it's hard to deny what you see in your own students' work as opposed to, let's say, using a standardized test. It's to say we're doing really well here, uh, but maybe not with this, this set of demographics, um, but we're not doing so well here. However that would play out, I think, would be a fascinating question to sort of engage people. Thank you. Um, Veronica, do you have anything to add? The only thing I would, well, I would add is this idea of um, I think it's Torgny Wilkes uh, who refers to it as critical friends. Mm -hmm. And so who, who are the people the administrators are working closely with who can be a conduit between them and, um, and other members, like the people who are engaging in assessment. I think, again, as, as the others have referred to, having them directly involved and, you know, participating, attending the odd committee meeting or something like that can be really valuable. But I think it's about how are they getting information about how students are doing? Because if they're not in the classroom themselves anymore, if they're not teaching, how do they stay connected with what's happening day to day in the, in the undergrad or the grad curriculum? So I think it's that connection between where they are and the day to day operations that are really important to think about. All right, so unfortunately we have run out of time, but I would like to thank Veronica, Jill, and Peggy for joining us today and um, sharing all their knowledge with us. If you have any questions for presenters, feel free to contact them using the information on the screen. If you're interested in learning more about HECO and would like to join our mailing list, please go to www.hecco.com and enter your contact information in the bottom right-hand corner of the page. All of the slides that you saw today and a recording of this webinar will be posted on the HECO website probably early next week. So when you leave the webinar, we ask that you take a moment to complete the survey. We would like to hear about your experiences so we can improve our webinars. We would also like to welcome ideas for future webinars. Our next webinar will happen on October 29th, and it is going to explore the student services learning outcomes, so we're very excited about that. So thank you again to all of our presenters, and I hope you all have a wonderful day.